knowledgeable persons. And in our survey, we have uh, covered many cities in India and we've covered Dubai. But what is missing, because it is knowledgeable persons, we can't miss out on uh, the knowledge base in Pakistan. So we now have a, we're doing a consultation with the Pakistani businessmen, which would focus exclusively on informal trade to, uh, to basically bridge this uh, gap as well. And on tariffs, I think, Vakar, you're very right. Uh, when we were also looking at our list and your list, for India's exports to Pakistan, a large number of these items are actually drawing high tariffs. So that we can't say that it is only because of uh, uh, it being on the negative list. Uh, tariffs, are play, tariffs are playing a role. And so we do need to address that. And even on the Indian side, the fact that textiles is continuing to be imported in such large quantities from Pakistan, the reason, even though the standards issue has been resolved, uh, it, the only residual thing is tariffs. And if India were to offer zero duties, uh, I think what would the biggest import uh, would be in textiles, especially ethnic textiles from Pakistan to India. Uh, may I now request uh, Manoj? Can you? What is the order? Am I next? Yeah, yeah, yeah you are next. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Nisha. And Thank you, Ikria, for inviting me to this third uh, meeting. I was there for the first two also, right? Yeah, I was there. One here, then in Pakistan, back here. Now, after these two presentations, there's really not much I can say or, in fact, have anything to say on the volumes and the methodology. I think the only thing that is interesting as far as informal trade with Pakistan is concerned is why do we worry about it at all? I mean, we have informal trade with many other countries, don't worry too much about it because typically you expect it is either border trade, that is trade in items which are too expensive to trade through normal conventional channels like timber or stuff like that. Either it is border trade or it is two communities living on either side of the border who trade with each other because, you know, you've got a relative living on one side who says, look, this is a quicker way to trade than go through any formal channels. It happens everywhere. It happens in India, Bangladesh, happens in India, Myanmar also because you know, Myanmar and Mizoram and Nagaland are like Punjab and Pakistan on this side, same thing. I think this, the reason why this uh, issue of informal trade in Pakistan merits some attention is because of volumes. That whatever you may say about the estimates which I have seen range from 1 to 2 billion, as he said in other studies, 5 billion. You know, I have seen a Fiki study which also lumps the, uh, all the trade coming from Dubai to Pakistan also as informal trade. Suppose we put that also in as diverted trade. So we're actually including not just the typical border trade, which is normally small. And let me finish that off. The typical informal trade or border trade which happens is normally small. And it happens because small volumes do not justify the high costs of any organized trade. Organized trade has got costs. There are banking channels. You have to establish trade channels on both sides. There are some fixed costs. So typically, informal channel avoids all those fixed costs of organized trading. It, it tends to happen at low volumes. But here, the surprising thing is not only that the volumes are not only large, but some people seem to estimate more than the organized trade. Not only is it larger, but even the items seem to be very similar. Textiles, you know, garments and automobiles, and then what is it, jewelry and uh, you know, pharma and stuff like that. So obviously it seems to be something which is parallel trade, which can be explained either because of illegality, but then that, you know, that, that doesn't, make, doesn't make sense from a long-term point of view. Why should illegality continue unless trade is banned? Or it is because of tariff barriers, which is mentioned, which makes a lot of sense to me. Or it may be also because the uncertainty of organized trade. See, uncertainty of organized trade makes informal trade a far better way to work. Because when you do trade in an organized manner, then you need a certainty of trading channels, certainty of custom procedures, because it takes, you are in for the long haul. Informal trade can be up one year, down the next. I think it's the uncertainty, which is what explains why it's, it seems to be increasing and seems to be as large as the formal trade. Now, one of the things that does create the uncertainty, apart from the politics, which are, frankly, the political part of the whole thing, the least said, the better it is. Uh, but let me, co I'll come back to that later. But as far as the uh, uncertainty is concerned, one major factor is this MFN. I'll tell you why. Whatever you call it. 
Even a Hindi name, Punjabi name, Bengali name, Andhra name, whatever you call it, as long as it ultimately means the same thing. See, the reason is that, as you know now, in most countries have got onto this, what is called the Trade Facilitation Agreement. And let me tell you, Nepal took, was very interested in joining the WTO and paid a very high cost because these idiots happened to join the same time as China and they were subject to the same uh, degree of, you know, uh, strictness as China was. But they wanted to join the WTO because they wanted to take India for not providing them TF facilities, not facilitating the trade because they are a landlocked country and they can do it. Now, to the extent that one day India will also be part of the TF agreement and so will Pakistan. To the extent that Pakistan does not give MFN to India, they will be very difficult to enforce any kind of trade facilitation on India in the world. In the, in, the, in, the, in the international fora. And believe me, these international fora have worked well. They've resolved bilateral disputes between many countries, Indo-Germany, Indo-US, Indo-France, many bilateral issues between large countries, between large and small countries have been resolved fairly well in the system which is now accepted in the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO. So to the extent that both countries are large enough, and particularly Pakistan, uh, want to become part of uh, organized trading channels, I think there is no other way but to get into the issue of MFN. Tariffs is something which can be done later on. It's not really the sticking issue, but the MFN really is the most important issue in terms of being part of the organized trading channel, which itself will lead to a reduction in the... Now, I'm going to... Because I told frankly, I'll finish very quickly because I have very little to say on this matter. Now, I'm going to say the same thing which I said listening to the first channel, morning session and same thing I did say in November when I was in Pakistan. I said, you know, for 65, 70 years, they've been saying, give peace a chance. I think it's about time the economists have a right to say, why don't you give trade a chance? It hasn't worked too well 65 years. As far as I can make out, there have been so many peace visions. But in 2002, when I first went to Pakistan, there was a daily flight. And not only PIA, but Indian Airlines. Of course, the Indian Airlines guys who say, are in se matlo, wo better airline hai, se do, we're too lazy, they wanted to cancel the flight. They would encourage you to take the PIA flight instead of the IEC flight. But there were flights on both sides. Even those have declined, the more peace measures you're taking, the more you're talking about security issues, the worse it's getting for trade. And I'll tell you why. Because when you talk of peace and security, you do not create the self-interest constituency which wants peace to take place. Now, for example, in the morning, someone rightly mentioned, I think he's absolutely right, that the Pakistan security establishment has a lot to say in deciding whether trade takes place or not. So instead of telling them, look, let the civil establishment do what it should do, why don't you tell them, look, you also have a stake in trade. Are you telling me that the security establishment in Pakistan has no interest in the economic developments in Pakistan? Of course they do. They have a huge interest. Why are they not stakeholders in the trade? Why are they considered the obstacles to trade? Maybe it's good to remove them, but they are there and they're going to be there in the next five years. Why don't, why are they not party to the trade discussion? Because the logic is only trade can create constituencies large enough to, to overcome the political obstacles. Politicians do not have enough interest to remove the obstacles to trade. But traders have the interest to remove the obstacles to political obstacles. Please be very clear about that. Someone mentioned, I will tell you, Biggest example, India, China. Whatever people in this room may think, the Chinese issue as far as security is concerned is far more of concern for India than the Pakistan issue. Pakistan is more of a political issue for one particular political party in particular. But the other one is actually a much real, much more worrisome security issue. Why does nothing happen? It's the largest India's trade partner. Try to think about India's deficit with China is more than its total trade with almost all bilateral trade partners. Total trade, just the deficit alone. Yet why is it that you're not able to? I do a lot of work for the Ministry of Commerce and DIP. Any time you have 10 people saying, let's take this action against China, you've got 25 others saying, no, no, don't do it. And you, any time you want to say, let us reduce the, let us these power, these people importing power equipment from China are killing us and we can't manage to make domestic uh, equipment at the low cost. You've got these power, the state trading corporation, state power corporations saying, don't do this. Our cost of power is going to go up and that's going to be a political problem. So unless you create these vested interests, believe me, although 
most people say won't happen before the indo eu trade fta takes place or before the indo us fta takes place and indo china fta will take place and the next thing that will happen is china fdi into india although that is almost banned at the moment so start thinking in terms of these issues that how can you create constituencies which will keep the politicians and the security guys at bay in both countries the indian security does not determine trade there's no doubt about that but they do determine security and they all also would be happy enough to make enough noise to make sure that they don't become irrelevant so that's true on both sides of course far more important than the pakistan side so the question really is how to create economic constituencies and i always say biggest example india is china it's huge i mean the the discussion is never about pakistan trade i mean i do a lot of work with the ministry of commerce we have never discussed pakistan issues no one says hey listen if you reduce duty what's going to happen to imports from pakistan no one does very small for india the issue is political one way or the other and mostly for north india actually and for china but it is in, in it is in pakistan's economic interest to think about it because china in india you cannot get any major trader to be they get very excited about india pakistan trade it's not worth it total value of trade whatever you call it 2 billion 3 billion very small and you can't get any any of the major traders of either auto parts or pharma which are very big now in the world to get very excited about trading with pakistan it has to be purely a political issue for the government to and i do believe and i'm quite convinced that once we are able to get back on the table and we will whether we agree or not someone will make us agree hope i don't care who it is someone will that's all that matters and ultimately they'll get back to trading and we should not again go back and i'm going to end with frankly i was amazed to hear that you know great foreign minister of yours hina rabani kar former foreign minister and what she said in lahore you know she's fascinating what she said and she said the chinese told her the chinese told her one of the best things to learn in negotiation is those things which are immediately non negotiable to leave them aside so you forget about kashmir for the moment forget about afghanistan for the moment can we not look at only trade and it's fascinating because that's exactly what china has done with india at least we have an loc in arunachal we don't even have an loc there's no agreement at least we agree as mr mani shankar i like to say un un what is what is unstoppable and un uninterrupted. uninterrupted and uninterruptible and he says put a chair there and discuss and i asked about where to put, put the chair well at least we know that an loc they can put a chair but if we did that with china we don't even know where to put the chair in the first place there is no place to put yet you see that issue never has hindered indo pakistan indo china trade It's the largest trader only the foreign investment graph is flat because we just don't allow foreign investment and you will see that changing too so as i said give that a chance forget these contention issues not because they are over not because they don't matter but precisely they matter so much let's leave them for the moment or let's leave trade It's, the choice is yours thank you May I now request uh, Manav Majumdar, Assistant Secretary General Fiki, to give uh, his perspectives uh, from a business angle? Thank you. Thanks, Nisha. Uh, good afternoon. Let me begin by thanking Ikria for this kind invitation. Uh, I really value this opportunity. And in next few minutes, whatever I'm going to say, just uh, caveat: it is my personal view, not necessarily Fiki's view. uh let me uh begin with two uh, small observations regarding the presentation uh of course i must preface by saying that both ikria and the sdpi study both are very useful contribution to the subject we have found them useful i had the opportunity to go through the sdpi study although it was you said 2012 data but that was good contribution it was an update of the earlier one and this one only now i had a look two quick comments on that although those are both are very useful on the clear the on one of the slides it is the reason for informal trade uh, difficulty in meeting standards were cited by only 1% of the sample 
Now, let me just submit, it might be, it might be just, an, um, just to share with, for your consideration and go back to your uh, samples. It may be a result of information asymmetry. Probably people don't know the samples or the traders that are not quite aware of the standards that have to be met while exporting or trading by formal goods. So if we try to reconcile this figure with information asymmetry, probably this one will come a little larger. That is just an observation. Jewelry. Jewelry has come in contrast to the SDPI uh, survey uh, as topmost item of India's exports to Pakistan through informal route. Uh, over 1.1 1 .1 billion as compared to less than 80 million dollar in SDPI. Which one? Jewelry or data? <laughs> yeah. No, well said. Uh, so even the duty I have seen it just five percent. So high duty or the negative list do not explain. So maybe it would be very useful to go back and see and further explore uh, why jewelry really uh, it has come on such a by such a huge margin. The rest are of course fine. But these two observations are, of course, not to take away any credit from the very excellent presentation and excellent work. Now let me turn into two, three other points. The informal trade, uh, very obviously, it exists because it makes economic sense to engage into informal trade. Now, informal trade, to the extent it's inimical to the economy, to the industry, as Wakar had uh, highlighted in his presentation. To the extent we'd like to curb the incidence of informal trade, it is obvious that we have to really, without or minimize, reduce those economic incentives, economic rationale that exist for informal trade. Now, there are many policy suggestions uh, in the literature and in the latest presentation, very useful. I just want to add few, maybe overlapping. Uh, of course, high tariffs, Walker has mentioned, high tariffs have to be reduced. Wherever non-tariff barriers are there, I don't want to venture into that because there is a full session on non-tariff barriers later, but to the extent non-tariff barriers also make it economically useful, economically lucrative to get into <coughs> the informal trade. We need to look into that, both sides of the border, of course. Apart from that, business facilitation or trade facilitation, whatever way you define, those are the most useful steps. Now, we know all those business facilitation <laughs> and trade facilitation measures which have been advocated, articulated in the recent past and in the literature, including financial facilitation, then wherever you need to add number of possibly land routes, and even in the existing land routes to add to the number of uh, admissible, permissible products. I would just like to add two points to that. One is a trade investment nexus. The investment part, we need to point out how investment, stepping up of investment in either side of the border, as and when situation is more comfortable, that would lead to reduction in informal trade. So that is one. Doing business, trading across border, I have already mentioned here, only two points or two sub points. One is the testing facilities. I mean, only one border post is not enough. Testing facilities and allied facilities are absolutely necessary if we have to maximize the utilization of those either land routes or border posts. And second is if one country 
the one side is getting it updated, modernized, say in the form of integrated check post or similar, it will be useful only when the other side is also reciprocating. Otherwise, there will be a mismatch and that investment will be probably less than optimum. Last point is <coughs> greater role of business chambers, business organizations, and call it whatever track. Because unless and until we can reach out to the business, we can convince them, business and related stakeholders, <laughs> that formal trade is not so difficult and formal trade is going to be easier with all these policy and interventions when they are in place. Simultaneously, if we can't really convince the business, and I am glad that ICRIAR is planning to